So as we go through each of these gifts in this list, what we're going to do is we're going to go straight to the Word of God, and we're going to look at examples in which we see these various gifts actually in operation in the Bible. Okay? Now, there's two other passages in the New Testament that list, if you will, the spiritual gifts. And why I say if you will will be evident in a moment. There's Romans 12 and Ephesians 4 along with what we have 
church or, or even the church, but the purpose is to point us to Jesus of cause us to appreciate more and intentionally submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Amen. So if God has gifted you in some way or caused you to whatever it is that you have to offer. She just she just didn't turn it up. <laughs> All right, so we have a a surprise for our YouTube uh, visitors this morning. <laughs> so again, the purpose is to teach us, of, point us to, appreciate more, submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. So if God has gifted you in some way that causes whatever it is that you have to offer, glorifying and, and building up your brothers and sisters, and it's not on one of these lists, it doesn't mean it's not a gift, Okay. You don't take this gift of yours and say, well, man, I don't see it on this list, so I guess I don't have a gift. We're not to look at this legalistically or pharisaically. Does that make sense? And, and the fact that none of these listens, lists in Romans 12, Ephesians 4, or 1 Corinthians 12 are identical, right? None of them are identical. That clearly suggests that Paul's not attempting to exhaust the subject in any of these passages. So let's not get goofy and think this, is, this list is all there is. Man, listen, if God has gifted you in some way that you're able to see things and do things or operate in things that others without that particular gift are unable to do, you have a spiritual gift, okay? And that spiritual gift is somehow to point us to and teach us of Jesus Christ and point to him. That is a spiritual gift. And again, listen, man, that's how you're able to discern whether or not what you're seeing before you is authentic or a legitimate working of the Holy Spirit. That's the other thing we covered last week, right? But with all the funny business going on in the church today, you now know how to discern if what you're witnessing is an authentic move of the Spirit. Remember that last week? We asked that couple of questions. Is what's before you, is what you're seeing, is that glorifying of teaching of pointing to Jesus Christ, or is it a distraction? Is it just goofy and weird? Because, man, God ain't weird, man. Is it drawing attention to another person? Remember the Apostle Paul was warning Timothy that one of the pitfalls that you and I can fall into is having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. And that's what a lot of these bogus manifestations of the Spirit are about, really. You got people that are somehow trying to draw attention to themselves, man. Hey, look at me. I'm awesome. Look at the spirit moving through me. Ain't I spiritual? Well, no, you're just goofy and pushing people away from Christ. And that is having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. So you're going to be exposed to this kind of garbage from time to time in the church today, amen, particularly today. So you're going to need discernment. Now, interestingly, one of the gifts that we're going to be looking at this morning is discernment. So we're going to have a chance to operate in that even as we teach this lesson. Now, the Holy Spirit does desire to gift His people in legitimate and powerful and yet very practical ways that allows us not to build ourselves up or call attention to ourselves, but to build each other up in the Lord. So beginning here in verse 8, we now have a particular listing with some of the spiritual gifts here. And keep in mind, this is not intended on the part of Paul to be exhaustive, but these are within the context of what was going on in the Corinthian church. So keep that in mind. Let's dig in in verse 8. If you ain't got your Bibles open, open your Bibles up. There's Bibles under the chairs to 1 Corinthians. Real easy to find just before 2 Corinthians. Someone, someone's got it open in the Bibles in the church. You want to call out that page number? 1139. 1139. I know I have it up on the screen, but it's always good to have the book in front of you. Chapter 12, right? Yes. Verse 8. For to one is given, underline that, for to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. All right, I had you underline that phrase, for to one is given. That Greek word given there is what we call in the Greek the perfect present tense, 
And that means it's a continuous action over and over and over and over. These gifts are given from time to time, as we're going to discover down in verse 11, as the Holy Spirit sees fit at his discretion. Now, I think there's some real moves out there to sort of box God into one camp within the court of man and another camp within the court of man. But but as men, we like to box things up and and make it nice and neat in, in our little finite minds, right, in order that we can somehow try to comprehend the infinite mind of God. Possible. So we've got this camp over here. Hey, man, the gifts are not for today. And the camp over here, yes, they are. And I don't think we want to box God into one camp or the other in the courts of men because that's when division comes into play. But there's those who believe that the gifts of the Spirit are no longer for today, and we call that school of thought a cessationist, that they have ceased. And I definitely in my own opinion, think that's a wrong view. And you don't have to agree with me at all, right? We could still be friends and go to the same church. But then you got those, and I am among these, that think the majority of the gifts are for today. And that's called a continuationist. Maybe not all of them, but certainly most of them, because I think God is just as interested in moving in the 21st century as much as he did the first century believer. I'm just dumb enough to know that God's God, and the Holy Spirit's the Holy Spirit, and Jesus is Jesus, and the church is the church, and it's in every bit as need right now of the empowering of the Holy Spirit as it has ever been. Amen? And I also believe that most of the gifts of the Spirit are, in fact, distributed to the present-day believer. Now, somewhere in the middle, you have really godly and good people Uh, who subscribe to what I call or what they call a partial cessationist viewpoint. And those that subscribe to this view, one of the more visible ones among them are Dr. John MacArthur. But these guys believe what we call the sign gifts, the gifts of healing, the gifts of speaking in tongues, and certain miraculous manifestations. They believe that those have ceased at the end of the apostolic age. When the apostles went away, those gifts went away that those gifts were necessary to authenticate the ministry of the apostles. Now, when you look at the writings of the early church fathers like Oregon and Tertullian and Augustine, they subscribe to that partial cessationist view as well. And they recorded in their writings that these sign gifts had ceased in the early church within the first couple of centuries. And I think it's important to recognize that these sign gift cessationists that they in no way, John MacArthur in no way, suggests that, that God doesn't heal anymore. Okay, they don't believe that. That's not their view. They in no way suggest that God no longer heals and God no longer works miracles. Their view is simply that God no longer uses men as agents of that healing. He simply does, does it himself in response to the prayers and petitions of his people. Make sense? Now, I know this can all get confusing, okay, and we'll dig into this a little bit more in chapter 14 and and yet this morning, but listen very carefully to two things I'm going to say. You listening? Number one, don't listen to what I say. (laughs) Serious. I'm just a knucklehead saved by grace, just like you, all right? The Word of God calls you, tells you, Acts 17, 11, that you are to search the Scriptures to see if what being taught here is is legit, called being a Berean. And number two, recognize, guys, that, look, this is not a salvation issue here, all right? Let's keep this in perspective. This is not a gospel issue. Remember what Paul tells uh, Timothy, uh, Paul tells us, us, not Timothy, in Romans 14, 5, one man regards one day above another, and another man regards every day alike. Let each man be fully convinced in his own mind. And this is where we need to stand on all issues in the Scripture that don't deal with salvation, okay? In other words, the Word of God leaves room for healthy, growing, speculative debate on non-essential doctrines, okay? It's good to have that. That's how we grow. Those who've been through the theology class and stuff, we talked about the numbers list, about where we stand with pre-trib, post-trib, is the gifts for today, not for today, on a scale of 1 to 10, how, how much do you believe that or not? Man, my numbers are going up and down all the time, let me tell you. 
and that's okay. They're not tens. They never will be tens, and if they are, then you are selfish and you are <laughs> a Pharisee, all right? Because that means you're dogmatic about something that you can't be dogmatic about. Just like when we went through the book of Revelations, most of the book of Revelations, so many people are dogmatic about that stuff. You can't be. Nobody knows. Well, one person does. Amen? But I personally cultivate a healthy debate and searching into these non-essential doctrines, man. I love it. And so these are, these are issues which we are not to divide over, but to grow in. And in the meantime, dispensing love and grace along the way in the process. All right. Praying this puts us into proper perspective, but let's start getting after these gifts. The first spiritual gift listed here is what Paul calls the word of wisdom. Now Solomon in Proverbs 4, 7 said this to his son, wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get wisdom. And there's no doubt, look man, the word of God will make you smart. Amen? As you read the word of God, you begin to see issues in, within life as God sees them, and you begin to live life after the wisdom of God, and you begin to align your thinking. The more you're in the Word, the more your will and your heart are aligned to the Word of God, and you will begin to make wiser choices for yourself. How many amen and hallelujahs can you get in here? Right, Mike? Right, right, uh, Mike? Man, I... 40, first 44 years of my life, man, I can, that's proof on the other side of the spectrum. But that's not what's being referred to here, okay? Paul's not talking about making wise decisions. Mark carefully the word, word here, word of wisdom. In other words, we're not talking about a thing that's acquired. We're talking about a thing that's given at a moment in time. Though it's a word of wisdom. It's a flash that comes from God. How many know what I'm talking about? It's just something that comes to your soul, man, at a moment in time where the Lord blesses you with supernatural wisdom that you would not have. When you go to the Gospels now, again, we're going to look at what the Scriptures say about this. When you go to the Gospels, they were always chucking questions at Jesus, right? It, it, it appeared, most of those questions appeared to have absolutely no win answers. They came to him and said, Rabbi, should we pay our taxes, right? Well, if he said, yeah, go ahead and pay your taxes, then they could say to the Jewish community, man, this guy ain't no friend of Israel. He wants us to take our God-earned money and hand it over to the Roman pagans. And if he said, no, don't take your pack, take your taxes. <laughs> wow. <laughs> pay your taxes. Then they go to the local IRS officials and say, hey, there's a guy out there on the streets promoting the idea that we shouldn't be paying our taxes, and then they'd arrest him. How in the world do you answer a question like that? In Jesus, we know that all the spiritual gifts were in operation, amen? He's the only one who had all the gifts in operation. So here's a no-win question. And with the mind and the wisdom of God, and I love this, in the Bible, Christ actually said, show me the money. <laughs> right, Jerry? Show me the money. <laughs> but Jesus says, with the wisdom of God, show me the money. Whose inscription is on that coin? All right, fine, we'll give to Caesar what's Caesar and give to God what's God's. Marvelous answer, man. And then when they brought the woman caught in adultery to him, what'd they say? Teacher, our law teaches us that she should die. What say you? Now, how's he going to answer that? <laughs> I mean, if he says, well, go ahead and kill her, well, that's hardly a friend of sinners there. And if he says, don't kill her, well, that puts him in opposition to the law, and they'll kill him. And so he says, look, guys, you're right. The law does say that. But let's do it this way. He who is without sin cast the first stone. Man, marvelous. Wisdom. That is a word of wisdom. Evidently, Christ will wear these guys down because we read in Luke's gospel what? They feared to ask him any more questions, <laughs> right? I think they got tired of looking like idiots, so they're like, enough of this business, man. We're not going to ask this guy any more things. But listen, man, the, the wisdom of God shuts the mouth of men. 
Remember, Jesus told his disciples, man, there's going to come a point where you guys are going to be persecuted. And they're going to bring you before the authorities. Don't prepare a sermon. Don't think about what you're going to say. In that hour, it will be given to you of my Father the wisdom that you are to speak. And so one of the ways that the Holy Spirit might flow through the life of a believer is with this gift of a word of wisdom. That when you're backed into a corner and you don't know what to say and you don't know how to respond, the power of God might manifest the gift of this word of wisdom in power. Now, I've been in a number of situations in my life where there's been a fork in the road and there's a significant decision to be made and out of nowhere, man, the least educated person in the room is says something like, well, why don't we do thus and such, right? And you're like, it's so profound and so mind-boggling. You know that person didn't come up with it. So you just know that the Lord gave that person a word of wisdom, right? (laughs) So there's the word of wisdom. And that's usually me. (laughs) And again, it's not that we have the all-wise among us. It's not like we got Obi-Wan Kenobi sitting at the back of the church (laughs) answering questions that we might ask. But it's a word of wisdom. It comes in an instant. It comes from time to time in a flash. Now, the second gift we have here, Paul calls the word of knowledge. And again, we all know smart people we might call when we get stuck on who wants to be a millionaire, right? But he's not talking about naturally acquired knowledge. He's talking about times where you know something you would not have naturally known. And when Jesus was confronting, again, we're going to the Bible for examples. When Jesus was confronting the woman at the well, Jesus said to her, what? Go get your husband. And she said, I don't have a husband. And she's like, that's right, you got five, (laughs) right? Well, how did he know that? Well, it was a word of knowledge. It was the knowledge of God being manifested. Because God knows all things, right? Let's look at Acts. Here's Peter. You've got this couple in the early church trying to rip off the church, right? God gives Peter a word of knowledge. Ananias, I know you're lying here. And he calls them all because he knew what they were up to because he was given that gift of the word of knowledge. The Holy Spirit shared the knowledge of God with Peter. Now, again, remember, be careful. The Bible says these were given to build up the church 1 Corinthians 12, 7, Ephesians 4, 12, these gifts are given to build up the church. So God's probably not inclined to give forth a supernatural word of knowledge if there's no ministry being undertaken. These things aren't for giggles and goosebumps, guys. This is serious business. Pastors and leaders in the church need to be open to this kind of gift, and as does anyone as do all of you who seek to minister to individuals and groups and one-on-one settings and your family, whatever that might be. Now, I might be wrong, but I personally believe this gift might be behind much of what we call mother's intuition. I mean, my mom knew things that she could have not have possibly known when I was growing up, right? Like, how'd you get that knowledge, mom? Now, if it's just you and your Bible and there's not ministry being undertaken, the Word of God is all the knowledge that you're ever going to need, okay? We have to remember the context here. What's the context? First century church did not have the New Testament in their hands like we do today. So there's a real revelatory aspect, I think, particularly with this gift back then. Today, as a very practical matter, the Lord will just give particular people to be enabled to just understand and have unusual insight into the meaning of scriptures. I think we understand that that doesn't come easy to just everybody. I know it doesn't me, right? That there are good and smart and intelligent people that look at the Bible and it just sort of rushes at them, man. And that's why God has raised up the gifts of knowledge and the gift of teaching. But I believe Paul is here talking about the supernatural gift of knowledge, and I believe that's still available today as well. Again, just like the other, it's a word of knowledge. It comes at a moment in time, comes in a flash to enable a person seeking to minister to another with some piece of information that's going to lead them to do that more effectively for the glory of God. But back to the woman at the well. Five husbands. (laughs) That word of knowledge was dropped in order that he might, what? Open the door. And interestingly, to authenticate who he was. And we'll get into that in a minute. 
in order that he could steer that conversation to spiritual things, and he had his way with introducing her to the truth. Amen? Now, again, from time to time, people get goopy with these gifts. Someone will stand up in the church and say, Oh, man, God just told me there's somebody in here with a back problem. <laughs> Pretty easy to hit the dartboard on that one, right? How many in here got back problems? <laughs> Woo, I got a word today. It was good. <laughs> or how about, Ooh, the Lord just told me there's someone in here got friction in their marriage. Woo! How many got friction in their marriage? Yeah, you guys were the first ones. <laughs> right? Boy, you're really going out on a limb with that one. But there's people who are trying to draw attention to themselves or they're false teachers. Who, Paul says in Philippians 3.19, their God is their own bellies and they're simply trying to separate you from your wallet. At the end of the day, it seems to me that what we see in the Word of God, in the Word is that the word of wisdom and the word of knowledge are used during times of ministry or confrontation. In the context of the Bible, that's what we see. So therefore, particularly if you feel God has called you to some kind of leadership position or maybe counseling ministry like David and, and Deb over there or some other area where you're ministering to individuals, we got quite a few of those in here, then man, these gifts should be open to you that he might share with you the supernatural wisdom and the supernatural knowledge of God. Amen? All right, we got more gifts here, picking it up in verse 9. To another, faith. And I know Brian's got that underlined, underlined faith. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of the healing by the one Spirit. All right, first of all, We've got the gift of faith. Now, the gift of faith spoken of here, this is not talking about the, sa the saving faith that we as believers have in Christ. And, of course, the Bible tells us in Ephesians 2, 8, what? That the saving faith is a gift from God. But the charismatic gift of faith is that we are given the inspiration to step out into something that the Spirit, or, or the, the, through the Spirit, we would step out into something that we might not have otherwise done on our own. The gift of faith is when there's kind of a, an inspiration that comes to your heart, and you just believe it, and you just step out, regardless of what everybody else is saying, right? Maybe your friends or your family, they're like, look, man, are you nuts? You lose your mind, man? What are you, what are you thinking? And yet this gift of faith has been poured on you by the Holy Spirit, and you're like, man, I just know what this is what God has called me to do, and I just believe that this is the direction God is leading me into, and you just step out into that direction. And when Peter was walking into the temple, again, going to the Bible for examples, when Peter was walking into the temple, there was a lame man there. And Peter just grabbed this guy up by the hand and says, Silver and gold I have not, but what I do I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ, stand up and walk. And he just grabbed the guy and pulled him up. Now there's just an, an empowering that comes into your heart where you know beyond a shadow of a doubt, man, God has spoken to me, and this is the direction I am headed in. This is the gift of faith. Now for the controversial one, and I don't think it needs to be if we just don't box the Lord in here. Here we have the gifts of healing. Mark that it's plural. But I, I personally don't believe, this is me personally, don't believe that the, the Lord endows individual people with this singular gift anymore. Where everybody sort of go to a Benny Hinn concert. I mean, Benny Hinn church. And people just line up, and you got this one guy that heals everybody. Who's that drawing attention to? Men. But I do believe that God, from time to time, uses prayer and uses a laying on of hands to heal people today. I believe it. I've experienced it. I've seen it happen time and time and time again in the last 13 years at all these events and churches and youth groups and everything else I've spoken at. Even with this, within this church, amen? We've seen healing happen here. But doesn't the intercessory intercessory is the same thing. Yeah. But it's not, that's not one person healing somebody. Now, when you go to the Old Testament, how many healings do you see physically recorded in the Old Testament? 
Not many, huh? And then when you get past the apostolic age, when the apostles were here, you discover the same thing in church history as recorded by the church fathers. If you were to graph this activity on a bell curve before and after the time of Christ and the apostles, you see very little activity there. And this is, this is a veritable explosion of physical healings during the time of Christ and the apostles, right? Well, why is that? Well, when Jesus and the apostles were on the scene, the Bible tells us that these healings, that these signs did two things. They fulfilled prophecy, and they authenticated the gospel message. Listen, man, at the time of Christ and the apostles, that was the apex. It was the most monumental time in redemptive history. There was no New Testament Bible back then, so that's how God chose to authenticate his message. Oh, you don't believe me? Watch this. Dude, he was dead! (laughs) That's how he authenticated, and same with the apostles. Now, to normalize that, to normalize healing, to normalize physical healing to a level of experience back in the time of Christ, that would be to normalize the arrival of our Savior, and I believe that would be nonsensical. Another thing you need to consider is that these healings were never done for physical purposes only, and they only took place where the gospel was arriving on the scene for the first time, again, to authenticate. Remember Paul was sick, man? Remember Paul was sick in the Bible? Paul heal himself? Absolutely not. Nor did Paul ever heal any of his travel companions who also became sick. What did he tell Timothy? I'd take a little wine for that tummy issue. He didn't say you're healed. He didn't push him over either. But healings were not a normative thing in the Apostle Paul's ministry. We only discover them, again, tune in, when he enters a new region with the gospel. Study his ministry in Lystra and in, in Malta. Now, in the spirit of balance, let's not put a God in a box either. I believe today, wherever the gospel is breaking new ground, I don't see why God wouldn't do the same thing. And that's why I believe you hear these things, particularly in those third world countries, right? You hear some miraculous stuff going on over there. Listen, at the end of the day, you ain't got to agree with me. Search the scriptures for yourself. I'm simply giving you the best perspective I can biblically. Amen? I tend not to be dogmatic on these issues and lean to one side of the fence or the other. I don't think you have to draw a line in the sand and land in one or uh, one or the other of these courts of men. I just don't subscribe to that. I simply believe that there's enough evidence in the Word of God and recorded history to come to a reasonable and flexible conclusion that God is not to be boxed in. <laughs> so here's where I'm landing on this deal forever it's worth. I believe... The Holy Spirit gives certain gifts, and these lists are not inclusive. I believe the Holy Spirit gives certain gifts that are specific to specific ages, all right? J. Vernon McGee said this, I don't believe anyone today is gifted the same way that Martin Luther was during the Reformation. Key, key right there. At the end of the day, I just believe that the Spirit of God gives gifts to the body so that it might function in the age in which it finds itself. Now, I absolutely believe that God heals today from time to time, amen? But the main thrust of biblical and historical evidence suggests to me that God does not place this gift in individual people today. Again, I've been on the road 13 years. I've been out to some spectacular events and conferences and stuff, man. And and when I do see those so-called things going on, to me, it's a farce. It's a farce. But that this particular gift was given to the apostles at a specific apex in redemptive history where the gospel needed to be authenticated. Am I making sense? Now, again, please understand you don't have to agree with me, all right? I'm not saying this is is the way you have to believe. It's what the Bible teaches. I'm telling you what the Bible teaches, and you can't come to a, a conclusion on it except for what these gifts are for. This is a non-critical issue. Wherever you land, a cessationist, a a, 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 a cessationist, um, come on, somebody help me here. Continuationist. 
a partial continuationist, a partial cessationist, a full charismatic, recognize that this is not going to affect how you walk out your life in Christ tomorrow. It's not going to affect how you treat your spouse. It's not going to affect how you treat your coworkers. And it's not going to affect whether or not you're going to share the gospel with somebody tomorrow. Having said that, here's what we can speak to definitively in the Word of God. Does God heal everybody? No. Did God heal everybody back then? Then why would you think he does it now? Or why would you put this nonsensical, stupid stuff in people's mind that you're not healed from whatever it is you have because you're sinning or you got something in your life you need to get rid of or you don't believe? Knock it off. That's satanic. Jesus himself didn't heal everybody. How are you going to put that burden on somebody else? Remember, go back to the guy that Peter healed when he said, silver and gold I have not. When you go back to that story, we learn that that man sat at that gate in the temple for over four decades, which means Jesus walked by that guy numerous times and never healed him. Or when Jesus was at the pool of Bethesda in John 5, 6 through 7, Man, that pool was littered with weak and the infirm and diseased because what was a tradition? That somehow angels would come and stir up that pool, and whenever the angel would come and stir up that water, the first crip into the pool was healed. That was a tradition. So you got tons of sick people laying around waiting to get into this pool, waiting for this water to get stirred, and now here comes Jesus to heal this one lame guy, and he had to step over all these other lame and infirm people to get to one guy, to heal one guy. Now, why that guy? I don't know. Some say, well, it's because he had a great deal of faith. Look, man, this guy did not have any faith, all right? Jesus said to this guy, do you want to be healed? And he did not say, oh, yes, Master, I've been waiting for you. You're the Christ, the Son of the living God. He said, you know, gee whiz, Lord, every time I try to get into the water, somebody beats me there, and they're stepping all over me. This guy was not walking by faith. He was walking by sight. He was walking by excuses. But for whatever reason, Jesus looked in this crowd of infirm people and picked that one guy there to heal God does not heal everybody today, nor did he back then. But I do believe from time to time that God uses people in prayer and laying on hands to heal people. Now, does that then mean that the church is going to be in perfect health? (laughs) That was a rhetorical question, by the way. (laughs) Every person that's been healed in a church has eventually what? Died. But God, in his mercy from time to time, allows the church through prayer and the laying on of hands to taste a little bit of that resurrection power. In the day of the resurrection, all our bodies will be totally healed. For now, we just get a taste of it. Why? Well, we don't know. (laughs) But I will tell you what I do know, that the Bible says that one day we're going to look at all God has done and we're going to call it good. Our problem is, many of us might have had a loved one that God didn't heal. Boy, that'll bring you down low real quick, won't it? And make you point fingers at God and talk smack to God and maybe even walk away from him. Our problem is that, bam, we're looking right here. All right? God has all of eternity in view, not just here. He has all of eternity in view. We can barely see the nose on the end of our face. God has it all in view. God is doing things from that perspective, not yours. Not from this little tiny of a dot that we have for, what, 60 to 90 years here. So if God doesn't choose to heal anyone, man, I believe because the Word of God says that we're going to look at what he has done and call it good, I believe that he has done so, has chosen not to heal for an eternal purpose. And if you went to eternity one day, and someday hopefully you all will, to talk to those people who God did not heal for that eternal purpose, they would say, I wouldn't have traded that for a second. God is that good, and he does things that well. We're just so short-sighted, man. We just don't see it. We're operating on microscopically 
small information, all right? God has the totality of the counsels of eternity in view. So from time to time, through prayer and the laying on of hands, God allows us to taste that little bit of resurrection power there. And I believe healing is for today, and I believe God does that in response to the prayers of his people. I don't believe he uses individual men to do that today based on the preponderance of the biblical evidence and the historical evidence that we have. All right, the remainder of this list here in 1 Corinthians anyway, and I would encourage you in your own time to please go to Romans 12 and Ephesians 4 and look at the rest. But we got left here in verse 10, with the exception of a few scattered ones, we'll get to next week down to verse 28, is this. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, the ability to distinguish between spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. All right. First, we've got the working of miracles here. Now, now this Greek word for miracles, it really means power. How many have heard the, the, the Greek word for this? Dunamis, right? It's where we get the English word dynamite. It means power. Now, this, of course, was seen in who? Who do we see power in? Christ. Well, when he turned water into wine, he walked on the water, he raised the dead, and a whole bunch of other stuff, right? But there are times when God puts forth his power in miraculous ways. Now, tune in. That does not mean we should expect to see a miracle every day in our life. I want you to understand a couple things here. I think they'll help you. <laughs> Remember the God who very miraculously delivered Peter from prison by sending an angel, that same God allowed James to stay in prison. And what happened to James while he was in prison? He died. I think one of our problems is that we look at Bible history and we try to compress it. We have this concept that people in the Bible times just pulled a rabbit out of their head every time they turned around, not taking into consideration the length of time that was involved. Now, when you go to the book of Acts, it covers a, a time period between 30 and 40 years, and you see there are about 25 or 30 miracles recorded. So you're talking about what? Maybe a miracle a year? But we tend to read this and say, oh, look at this, bam, 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 bam. No, it's about a miracle a year, over a 25, 30 year. Now, I would imagine today, if you looked at the church around the globe, you probably find that there's Probably one legitimate miracle a year that's recorded. Legitimate. And by the way, all that's in what we think of as a miracle, to me, man, salvation is the greatest miracle there is. All right? You know, we, we'll read about some guy in the Bible, and a couple really dramatic things happen to this guy, and we'll say, wow, did that guy ever have it going on? Not considering that that covered about 70 or 80 years. So we read the Bible and we see all these things going on, and yet we have this tendency to forget these vast periods of time that's being compressed here before us. And yet God, from time to time, he'll sort of pull back the curtain and allow us to see his hand moving in the miraculous, right? Now, we then have listed four more gifts, three of them, prophecy, tongues, and the interpretation of tongues, those we're going to deal with specifically in chapter 14. And then finally here we have the gift of distinguishing the spirits. So the gift of discernment or distinguishing spirits, man, these people can sniff out false teachers 20 miles down the road. All right? They are the watchmen on the tower, and I personally thank God for them. Thank God that God has gifted them because he has gifted them to protect you. Guys like Justin Peters, Costi Hinn, whose dad is Benny Hinn. Costi got the heck out of there, went through theology and learned about God. Look up Justin Peters and Costi Hinn sometime on YouTube, please, and watch some of the videos because they are warning us. But we see Peter and Paul as well working in that gift. You remember the slave girl that had the spirit of divination in Acts 16 uh, and Acts 8? She just kept mouthing off. <laughs> and Paul finally turned around and dealt with her, didn't he? 
You remember when the church first moved into Samaria, there was this guy by the name of Simon the sorcerer trying to play the church, and here's Peter operating with the gift of discernment of the spirits, and he says to this guy, man, your heart ain't right, it's filled with bitterness, that's your problem, you better repent, and he jumped all over this guy. So the discernment of spirits is a much-needed gift in the church today, especially today, man. You can't even hardly, I mean, there ain't many around anymore. Now they're going to get you on uh, bookstores online, but you could hardly go to a Christian bookstore without this gift. And if you don't have it, you better take someone with you who does because the shelves are filled with the tares right alongside the wheat, and the tares are usually blap right out front. And I'm going to tell you right now, anything that's out front by Joyce Meyer and T.D. Jakes and Joel Olstein. Garbage. Okay? And again, if you don't agree with me with that, go look at Justin Peters. Go look at Costi Hinn. Go look anywhere. There's dozens of videos that will tell you why. And I know there's, there's people in here that listen to these people and don't agree with me, but let me just say this about one, Joel Olstein. Joel Olstein himself said, I am not a pastor. I am a motivational speaker. Okay? So he's not even a pastor. He uses this to motivate people uses it to motivate people. What's this used for? Salvation. But God has given us those with the gift of discernment in order to protect you. And I know people don't like to hear this stuff a lot. You'll hear me up here. I just did it. And I do this for your own good. I care less what you think about me. I'm warning you. And if you don't believe me, again, there's plenty of people like Justin Peters and Costa Hinn and tons of other people that go into this. They don't just pull things out of context about what these people say. They give you the, the, the goo on them out of their own mouth and their own words and in their own books to tell you what's going on. Please listen to that. Because if you're listening to somebody in, that's on that end of the camp, man, they're not teaching you about Jesus. They're not teaching you about the Jesus of the Bible. They're teaching you about their Jesus, just like the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons and all these other cults. Remember the three things we need. Remember we talked about this, Acts chapter 12, but the model, when we were going through uh, Exodus, we talked about that model in the temple. Word, prayer, and fellowship. Those are the three things that we need in the presence of God. So God has given us the fellowship, right, the body of Christ, and we'll expand on that next week so that we can consult brothers and sisters that are a little bit further down the roads than us that have the gift of the discernment of spirits. So use your brothers and sisters, man. All right, finally, we'll close with verse 11. All these are empowered by one and the same spirit. Pay attention here. Look who, I want you to look at this. Who appoints? All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. So who decides who gets the gifts? Is it men? I believe that this is the verse here that deals a crushing blow to all those goofy ministries and pastors out there that claim to be able to teach you the charismata. Bethel being the biggest one. Well, hey, man, just give us 600 bucks, come to the conference, we'll teach you how to heal, teach you how to speak in tongues, teach you how to prophecy, teach you how to walk in the miraculous, we'll teach you all this stuff, and we'll separate you from your wallets in the process. How are you going to teach someone to speak in tongues, man? Right here, Paul asserts very clearly it's the Holy Spirit who distributes these gifts as he sees fit. Distribution of the gifts of the Spirit are entirely at the discretion of the Holy Spirit. This is not a gray area. This is black and white. Understand that the gifts of the Spirit are not a salad bar. You don't get to pick and choose, man, and you don't teach somebody. I watched a video, speaking of Justin Peters and him and all these others, I watched a video one time because I, I want to know who these people are. I want to know who to warn you about. I watched this one guy on TV quite a few years ago was on some kind of talk show kind of like uh, David Letterman or something like that, but it wasn't that. It was older than that even. And he was on there, and he was teaching the whole audience how to speak in tongues. 
It sounds goofy, but we get caught up in all this stuff, man. Recognize at the end of the day, man, it's the Holy Spirit that picks these gifts and places them in you as he sees fit. And and that's how you want it, trust me. (laughs) God has designed you and God has created you. The Bible tells us he was always thinking about you, always. Remember Psalm 139? More than the sands are upon the earth. That's pretty poetry for saying that there's never a time where you are not on his mind. Be awed by that. Listen, man, God knows how to equip you. He knows what he desires to accomplish in each of your lives. He thought this through. He had it planned out before time. He has gifted you accordingly. He's the one that picked your gift. Now, I'm sure we've all received gifts we're probably disappointed in, right? Pretty sure you've been on the receiving end of a gift you didn't appreciate. But, man, we don't have to be disappointed in the gifts that the Holy Spirit gives us. Again, God has designed you. He knows how to complete you. He knows what he wants to accomplish in your life. And the fascinating thing is when you start operating in that gifting that God has for you, you're going to discover completeness. You'll discover that you are all that, you, that he designed you to be. Now, what's a saying to God when you and I give little or no thought to how we might, he might be empowering us with the gift? What does that say to God? Imagine if my wife had a, a gift for me, and all right, cool, and I throw it on the bed, and I wouldn't even bother to open it. What does that say to her? And what are we saying to God? That obviously does one thing. It grieves the spirit. When there isn't a longing on the part of his people to discover what it is that he has for them, it grieves the spirit of our Holy Father. But this week, maybe we just need to give a little thought to how it is that God has gifted us and what he wants to do in our life that we might discover all that God has created us to be. And then we might be used of God in building up his people, which brings glory to his name. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we just uh, thank you so much for your word. We do thank you for these gifts. Father, allow each one of us in here to understand uh, who these gifts come from and what these gifts are for. And if we haven't identified them yet, Father God, to go out there and proactively try and figure out what you have done for each person in here for the sole purpose of edifying the body of Christ. Father, we thank you so much for these gifts. It's just amazing. that It isn't enough you brought us to you. It saved us from hell, but then you give us all kinds of stuff. And you didn't have to. You didn't have to do nothing for us, Father. We just give you all the honor, all the glory. In the name of your son, Jesus, amen.